much. Your Excellencies, and our Royal Fathers, and everyone here, I honorably welcome everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. We're not going to listen to a long, long message. Just something short, brief, direct to the point. But I believe the Lord will impact every one of us as leaders in various areas of community and leaders over the stage and leaders beyond the stage. A word of prayer, Father, we well, thank you. We're here, not accidentally, we're here purposefully ordained that we should be here. And we're asking as we learn about Jesus more and more is all sufficiency for leadership and for bringing the purpose of existence into reality. We pray, Lord, your word will penetrate everyone Amen. and produce result in everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Without exception, bless everyone. Amen. Without exception, make us channels of blessings to our people. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We are going to talk about leadership very briefly. We're told in Psalm 37, in verse 37, it says, Mark the perfect man. You'll be looking for a man perfect in leadership, perfect in every way, because you say, Mark that man. Notice that man. Take note of him so that you can focus your mind, your attention, your life, your leadership. You can pattern what God has called you to do. After that man, mark the perfect man. And behold, the upright is telling us it cannot be upright without being perfect. It cannot be perfect without being upright. Behold, the upright for the age of that man is peace. I'm talking to you on Mark, the perfect model of a servant leader. And I'm talking about Jesus Christ. As we look at him from every angle, we look at him from prophecy, we look at him from the personality of being the one that God sent into the world to do a work that will lead people from left, right, center, from everywhere, and to lead them to the very highest and the best in their lives. There's no other one. He is the perfect man. And we behold him as the upright. Because the end of that man, the end, the purpose of uniting with him, of your connection with him, the end, that the purpose and the effect of you being with him is going to bring you perfect peace. And the purpose for which the Lord has created you, the purpose for which the Lord put you, you are not in Taraba state. You are not in your state anywhere you are by accident. You are danger of God to be here. And you will do well here. As I think about Christ, Jesus, the perfect one, the leader, one. I think of him as the servant leader. He came to serve you. I think of him as a sympathetic leader. He saw the blind, the lame, the impoverished, and the people in this world who are suffering, and he became the sympathetic leader. Number three, I think of him as the shepherd leader. He is the Lord, my shepherd. The Lord, your shepherd. And when he appeared in this world and he shepherded people, he protected people, and he prevented them from having anything that would destroy them. Number four, I think of him as a successful leader. He as a leader. 
sent by God into this world. He knew what the Lord sent him for. And he concentrated on that. And at the end, he said, it is finished. Nothing left that the Father, that God in heaven had ordained him for, that he did not finish. I think of him as a self-sacrificing leader. You know, Christ, when he came, he didn't want to get anything from anybody. He gave everything he had. Number six, I think of him as a spiritual leader. Because he was sustained by the supernatural power of the Lord. And I think of him as a set, seated, settled leader. We're told at the end of the gospel I'm going to go into now, when he finished his work and he left here, he went to be seated by the right hand of the Father. Set by the Father, seated by the Father, settled by the Father. And when you mark him, and you look intently at him and you want to be the kind of leader that he was. You ask him for grace and you ask him for strength. It will make you the leader you ought to be. I'm going to look at the gospel according to St. Mark. Of course, I'm not going to, you know, delve into the depth. But we're going to get principles out of the gospel according to St. Mark. I come to Mark chapter 1, and I'm talking about, I divide the message still very briefly to three parts. Number one, we're talking about transformational pattern from the servant leader. We look at Jesus Christ and we see anyone he gets in touch with, he transformed them. Might be from sickness to soundness, but he transformed them. Might be from a sinner to a saint, but he transformed them. Might be from somebody down below and he lifts him up. His leadership, his touch in the lives of people was like transforming lives. And when he gets in touch with you, and he's going to get in touch with you deeper today, and he's going to transform every area of your life. You'll be a better father, a better mother, a better leader, a better organizer, a better thinker, a better strategist. As you come to connect with him, the virtue in him, he will put in you even today in Jesus' name. And number two is the transferable principles from the sovereign leader. Uh, you see, there are principles that all you need to do, he has walked with that principle, I can walk with that principle. He has upheld that principle and he has succeeded by that principle. And that same principle is translated and transmitted and transferred into your life. So we talk about the, transform, uh, the, the transferable principles from the sub leader. And now number three is the transcending power. The power that transcends where you are at present. Obviously, for you to be at this level of leadership in education, in government, in whatever, you have had some power, some purposeful living to you. But now, as you get in touch with Christ, there is more to come in your life. And it gives us transcending power through the Savior Liberator. I, I come to number one. Number one, I look at chapter one. In this number one transformational pattern from the servant leader. As you look at chapter one, you find him of great priority. Number one is the remarkable priority of the servant leader. Priority. Priority. You need that word. You see, everyone on earth, if you're going to achieve, there must be a priority. Many things will call for your attention. Many things will call you here, call you there. And the things that makes you the leader you ought to be. Leader at home. Leader on the field. Leader in the office. Leader in your search. Leader in any section of area of your life is the one 
world priority. And what that we find in Christ. In Mark chapter 1 verse 14 now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. In verse 15, and he said, and saying, the time is fulfilled. He knew his time. He knew his time. It wasn't a waiting for another opportunity. It wasn't waiting for another chance. He knew the time is here. The time is fulfilled. Repent ye. It says the kingdom of God is now at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The point I want to raise up with you is, this is chapter 1 of Mark. And you find out all through his ministry, he emphasized the kingdom. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. And then he appeared to his own disciples. What was he talking about? The kingdom of God. He had a priority. A leader must have priority. What's the priority of your life? Where are you going? What are you going to achieve? What do you want to do? If we mark the model of this perfect leader, we have to have priority. As a mother, what's the priority over your children? As a father, what's your priority over your family? As a teacher, what's your priority for your students? As, um, you know, anyone, any leader in society, what's your priority? You must single out that priority and focus on it because we have this remarkable priority of the servant leader. Number two is the redemptive passion of the sympathetic leader. Uh, you meet Jesus Christ, you meet a man with passion, a man with courage, a man with purpose, and we must have that in our lives. If you are a so-so uh, leader, if you are a nonchalant leader, if you are, you know, a person that, you know, does not even any, have any passion, you know, the, the thing, the difficulties, they swallow up your passion, they swallow up your exi excitement, and you say, well, the world is so bad, I'm just managing to live. You cannot be a good leader like that, a successful leader like that, like Jesus Christ. He was a redemptive, he has redemptive passion of a sympathetic leader. Actually, we come to Mark chapter 2 for that. In Mark chapter 2, reading from verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, he had sympathy sympathy for him. He had passion to get him away from where he was to where he ought to be. He wanted to destroy all the things the devil had done, making this man an invalid and making him to be the man, to be the, the, the son of the living God that will achieve in life. And he said unto him, son, thy sins are forgiven. He started at the root. The base of the problem, the base of our confusion, the base of our guilt, the base of our, of our condemnation, and the base of what makes us useless in life, we cannot even think. I cannot think of tomorrow because today my guilt, my condemnation pins me down. But he came to him, he removed all that. He sympathized with him. And then he had redemption for him. The, redemption, the redemptive passion of a sympathetic leader. When we become leaders in our leadership positions, we must do something redemptive. We must do something that rescues people from where they are. Are you the head of a company? And you look at those people, you're not just thinking about what they offer, what they produce, what they do in the company, and what they achieve for me, for you. You look at them. Uh, is this a challenge in their lives that God wants to use to you as a redemptive contact? for them and you have sympathy on them we're coming to chapter three now chapter three is talking about the reproductive process by the succeeding leader and with all with all measurement and ramifications christ jesus was a successful leader heaven confirmed him 
he was successful. The earth confirmed him. He was successful. The whole nation, they said, we never saw anything like this before. And this successful leader, what do we find? If you are succeeding, you must have successors. The people that will take up the banner, that will take up the torch. Otherwise, all the success will be buried after you are gone. All the success will be drowned by the, by the timeless things that will take place. But Jesus Christ had foresight. And in his foresight, he had the reproductive process. What did he do? In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 14 of chapter 3. It says in chapter 3, verse 14, and your ordained 12, that they should be with him. He gathered people around him so that they will know at first hand what he did. They will experience at first hand what he did. And then that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. He wanted to reproduce himself in them. Are you a leader? Thank God you are. Will there be somebody? Will there be a successor or successors? Will there be people that are with you? You don't hide your reason for success. You don't hide all your techniques and what you're doing. You don't hide all the good, good things the Lord has put in your life. Christ was a succeeding leader. But he had a reproductive process and he chose the twelve. You know, some people will not like to choose people to follow after them, to see everything they do, to copy everything they do, to learn from everything they do because, you know, they cannot trust people. This one might let them down. This one might let them down. Judas let Jesus down. But all the same, he did it, you know, because of one Judas overlooked Peter, James, John, Matthew, and all the others as a leader. You must throw all those things away and have a reproductive process by the succeed, the solid leader. We are looking at number four. Number four is the revealed perception from the sowing leader. Here Jesus now gave an illustration. Well, it's called a parable. Really, it's an illustration. He's telling us a lie. If you're waiting until this one will succeed, that one will succeed, that one will bear fruit, you'll never do anything. And he told us that as you look at men around you, and you sow into their lives, and you impute him part things into their lives, one quarter of that land of the people you sow into will be like the wayside ground. Another quarter will be like a rocky ground. Another quarter will be like a thorn invested land. And just one quarter of the land you're sowing to will produce 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100 fold. In such a situation, what do I do? Because it tells us it's not every field you plant, it's not every project you carry out, it's not every person you help. It's not everyone you pour yourself into that will bear the fruit. What do we learn from that? Do more. Do more. And then be observant and be vigilant. Is that a thorny ground? Can I remove the thorns there and make it good ground before I plant? Before I give, before I pour everything I have into that person. Is that a rocky ground there? Can I remove some of the rocks there? Is that a wayside personality that welcomes everybody? And so it's never bearing fruit. He was a sowing leader. He didn't allow the Pharisees, the Sadducees, he didn't allow the people that had nowhere going to hinder him. 
he was going to keep on sowing. And the more you sow, the more the percentage will rise. And then from experience, you know, I sowed there before, it was, it was just side of the road land. I sowed there before, it was just rocky. I sowed there before, and it was just a sunny. Now from experience, you can tell the people you are sowing into. The parcel of land you are sowing into, bringing fruit and bringing fruit, do more of that. Check up your life. In your existence, what have you found productive? What have you found generating resource? Do more of that. Number five now is in chapter five. Is the, rely, is the reliable power of the sufficient leader. The reliable power of the sufficient leader. As we come to chapter 5 of Mark, is still showing us Christ as leader. But now, leader over the demonic realm. Leader over the disease realm. And leader over the realm of death. In chapter 5 of Mark, you come to five at three areas. One area, a demon possessed person ran after him and wanted deliverance. Number two, in that chapter five, a woman that had that disease 12 years long wanted healing. Number three, a child actually died. And here we find him sufficient for every situation. As we look at your life, what could happen? The worst that could happen is that there is a demon following after your life and he says the plan of God for you will not be realized. Or it might be a disease that stands for a long time. Or it might be premature death coming. Entering without knocking at the door just came into your family. Jesus is sufficient for it all. Amen. And whatever is the challenge, just calling on him, just touching him, life will come back again. Amen. Demons will not have a permanent hold of your life. Long-standing disease will not ravage your life that you cannot achieve what the Lord sent you here for to achieve you will achieve. And death, premature death, will not come your way. Amen. Life will come your way. Amen. And if you have been dreaming about death, dead death, I'm introducing somebody to you who has overcome death. I see I came to Ezekiel. You might know the story in the Bible. And he said, Ezekiel, set your house in order because you will die and not live. And Hezekiah did not respond to Isaiah. He, he appealed to the one that sent Isaiah. In uh, paraphrasing what happened, he was saying, Lord, I don't want to die now. <laughs> Why don't you want to die now? I've not finished the assignment and the vision that have cratered in my heart. I need healing. I need health. I need extra time. And the Lord was so gracious in the Old Testament. And the Lord is even more gracious now. He'll be gracious to you. Amen. You need time. I need time. You need time yes. to finish the vision, the assignment, the great thing the Lord has given you to do, he'll give you the time. Because Jesus had reliable power of the sufficient leader. I come to the second session of my message. I'm talking of transferable principles from the sovereign Lord. The supreme Lord. And here we come to chapter 6 now. In chapter 6, we're talking about the recurring provision of the shepherd leader. Christ Jesus was not just an ordinary leader. He was a shepherd leader. And he had provision for the people. In this chapter 6, the people 
had need of food, which they couldn't get immediately. And Jesus, the shepherd leader, provided for them. Chapter 7, chapter 8, another time came, he provided for them. He's done it so much and repeatedly, he will do it in your life. Whatever need this shepherd leader will provide for you. He will provide for me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. There are times like Elijah, you get tired, you get weary. And you want to stop your journey, but you are not at the end of the journey yet. And then you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, it's enough. And God says, you have not done enough. He's talking to you now. Amen. You've done much, you've not done enough. Amen. You've achieved much, you've not achieved enough. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, yea or yes, truly, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I now realize when Christ is with me, when Christ is with you, that thing that looks like death is not the reality of death, it's the shadow of death. And a shadow of a sword cannot hurt you. The shadow of a lion can not eat you up. It's just a picture. It's just a shadow. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear any evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You set a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head. A new anointing is coming upon you. And my, and my cup runneth over. Yes, yea. And it says truly and verily, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? That's our destination. When we have done the will of God on this earth, our shepherd will take us to that place. Number six, then, is the recurring provision provider as the shepherd leader. Number seven, is the relentless pronouncement of the supreme leader. Relentless is unrelenting in what he says and he showed the people he said this that i say is not just for the time being now it's forever and ever and his word is firm relentless pronouncement of the supreme leader that's why leaders don't talk flippantly that's why leaders don't just talk and talk and talk. And then you challenge him later. Oh, he said that was just a free moment in my life. I didn't mean that. Jesus never said what he didn't mean. And he's showing us that's the perfect model. If you promise anything, follow the perfect model. If you threaten anything, Follow the perfect model. Whether you say that in the private or you say it in the public. Here Christ is giving to us as the relentless pronouncer, proclaimer. As the supreme leader, I come to number eight. Number eight is the reaffirmed prophecy by the sovereign leader. The reaffirmed prophecy. All that had been said about him, he reaffirmed. He reaffirmed. He knew. He said, that which was written concerning me has an end and will be fulfilled. Why don't you think about what had been written concerning you? And what had been written concerning humanity in general? It says in Mark chapter 8 verse 34, it says there, when and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also he said unto them whosoever will come 
after me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And when you follow him, you follow him into success, into achievement, and into the satisfaction of your life. But you know, there are crosses to bear. He bore the cross. If he bore the cross, why would you be dodging your own cross, your own difficulty, your own challenge? It's through that road that is filled with challenges and thorns we go through and we get to what the Lord has ordained for us. And then he said, you must also deny yourself. What does that mean? You deny yourself of the present pleasure so you can have the future progress any progress we make in life you have to deny yourself of something now but even be denying yourself of sleep deny yourself of ease deny yourself of convenience so that you can have the future progress we're coming to chapter nine in chapter nine is the reassuring promise of the scriptural leader you see in leadership we have the scripture and the scripture helps us to understand that if we go this way we'll make it all through every area of your life can be successful Every area of your life can be at the peak if you allow him. Because you have the promise. Look at chapter 9 verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you can only believe when you pray. If you can only believe when you plan, if you can only believe when you project, if you can only believe when you perform, if you can only believe when you plan to produce, if you can only believe all things are possible for him, to him who believes is the reassuring promise of the scriptural leader we're coming to chapter 10 in chapter 10 we have the recreative possibilities through the savior leader the creative leader and the saving leader and he tells us there's the recreated possibilities you know the power all the power that god had originally when he created the whole universe he still has all the power and if he has to exercise the power over me he will and he will do something in recreative and redemptive in your life in jesus name and as we look at him as this kind of leader scriptural leader he tells us as a savior leader he tells us in verse 26 it says and they were astonished and they were surprised and they were amazed out of measure saying among themselves who then can be saved if this good man is not saved can i be saved if this seemingly upright man is not saved, can I be saved? If this hard working man, woman, does not succeed, can I succeed? When we see the failures of other people, when we see the downward trend of other people, and we think it's better than I more education he has than what I have, more opportunities and privileges that he has, I don't have. And if he does not make it, and I make it, with Christ, you'll make it. With divine support, you'll make it. In verse 27, he says, Jesus looking upon them says, with men, this is impossible. But not with God. For with God in your life, God 
in that project, God as your helper and God as your uplifter, with God all things are possible. All things are possible. If you can think of it, you can achieve it. And you can tell the Lord, Lord, here am I. I link myself with the omnipotent one. I link myself with the one that cannot fail. And as you get connected with him in your life, impossibilities will dwindle to nothingness. Because now with God in you, with God for you, with God by you, all things are possible. I come to chapter 11. In chapter 11, is the required pardon by the supplicating leader. Uh, you know, in our lives, you cannot go through life without somebody offending you. Not possible. Somebody, somebody close, somebody near, somebody far away will do something that you don't appreciate. And in leadership, we must have the required pardon by the supplicating leader. Let me explain. Imagine you have a bag hanged at your back. And every offense that somebody did, and you don't forgive, it throws a pebble there. And the next day, somebody does something. I don't like that. Talk to him. No, I won't talk to him. Forgive him. No, I won't forgive him. Another pebble goes into the bag. And over the years of many months and many weeks and many days, a lot of pebbles have gone into the bag there. It becomes heavy now. Anywhere you turn in this community, there are people who have offended you have not forgiven. Anywhere you turn on this street, there are people who have offended you have not forgiven. And the thing is so heavy. With that heavy bag there, you cannot run your race to the finishing point. You cannot achieve anything significant because that bag full of pebbles, heavy, is now weighing you down. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, in verse 25, he tells us, and when you stand praying or planning or trying to progress or making projects, when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any that your father also which is in heaven may forgive you all your trespasses and then in verse 26 it says but if you do not forgive you'll be carrying that heavy bag of pebbles at your back if you do not forgive you'll be increasing the weight and the pressure of that heavy bag at your back. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you your trespasses. That's terrible. To have sins that the Heavenly Father, call him any name, God, call him any name, Almighty, that he too will not forgive you. As you drag them to the weeping post, because you will not forgive, so the Almighty drags you to the weeping post because he does not forgive. He will forgive you. And he will give you the grace to forgive everyone. Somebody close you'll forgive them. Wife, husband, have you noticed when you don't forgive the husband, you don't enjoy the home. When you don't forgive the wife, you don't enjoy the home. And when you're recounting, he did this, she did that, 
You don't really enjoy your life for your own sake. And for the sake of getting to the height the Lord has called you. Forgive them. You too, you are forgiven. And life will go on in a pleasant way in Jesus' name. Point number three, transcending power through the Savior leader. In your life, if you could have a transcending power, more power than you ever experienced in your life. You know, at this point now, I want to do that, but I don't think I have the power to do that. I have the intention, I have the plan, I have the desire, but I don't think I have the power to do that. This afternoon is a moment of destiny that the Lord has given you that the power you don't have in Christ, the leader, will give you the power. Amen. Look at chapter, uh, chapter 12 now. In chapter 12, we're looking at the righteous practice of the sanctified leader. Here is Christ. And he's transferring his nature, his attribute, his attitude unto us. And now he grants us righteous practice. Something you begin you begin slowly, you begin small, and then in your life, you make a practice of that. The righteous practice of the sanctified leader. It says in chapter 12, chapter 12, reading from verse 14, And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true. And carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of man, but teachest the way of God in truth. Teaches the way of God in truth. What makes us not to stand, not to be steadfast? Not to be dependent on because we look at the faces of men before we say what we want to say. We know the truth. We have the truth. We're giving and committed to the truth. But look at him as he is there. I think I have to modify what I say. Once you modify the truth, it's no more truth. I think I have to tone down. But I have to say, because of her there. Once you tone it down, it's no more the perfect, absolute truth. But Jesus Christ, the sanctifying leader, Jesus Christ, that gives us another heart, a pure heart, a circumcised heart, a renewed heart. He makes us to have the righteous practice of always telling the truth that we know. If I tell all the truth I know, I will get into trouble. No, not really, not really, not really. If you tell all the truth you know, the God of truth will stand by you. If you done something wrong and they, and they confronted you, did you do this? Uh, what do I do now? Do I modify the truth or do I tell the truth? God of truth, stand by me. Yes, I did it in my carelessness, in my ignorance. Okay, don't do that again. You are forgiven and you'll be like you're flying in the air. And every time you tell the truth, every time you tell the truth, the God of truth and the God of heaven will stand by you. Yeah. He will support you. Yeah. And he will hold you, hold you as righteous as his only begotten son. Teach the truth. 
say the truth, experience the truth, and transfer the truth into the lives of the people you come across. We'll come to chapter 13, and it's very focused preparation for the soon coming leader. He told his own people, I've come the first time, and I'm going to come the second time. And with all the signs he has given us, we know that this, our leader, sovereign leader, the leader from heaven, we know he is coming again. I said, Jesus is coming again. Yeah. You believe? Yeah. You believe? Yeah. I used to think that it's only the real devoted believers, Bible reading, Bible believing, Bible exalting people that believes that Jesus is coming again. But I've now realized that even our other brothers and sisters on the other side, they're telling us, in fact, one of the leaders on the other side sang, and I had the song with all the people in his place saying, whether we like it or not, Jesus is coming soon. Whether you like it or not, whether you approve it or, of it or not, whether you recognize that or not, whether you remember that or not, in all the things you do, Jesus is coming soon. Give me a good, good amen. amen. What does he expect? I see he's coming soon. Look at Mark chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 33. Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 33. Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. In verse 34, in verse 34, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who led his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man of his word. He gave his word and commanded the porter to watch. Verse 35, in verse 35, watch it therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening, at noon, midnight, or at cock crowing, or in the morning, verse 36, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Verse 37, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, watch, watch. If you have something precious you don't want the thief to take away, watch. If you have a goal, if you have a destiny, if you have a place you are going, you don't want the stranger to divert, distract, or turn you around, watch. And when the Lord comes, you'll be ready. We're looking at chapter 14. In chapter 14, it says, this is the repented Peter before his sovereign leader. The leader, the Lord Christ, had been arrested. And Jesus had warned Peter ahead of time. And eventually, somebody came to ask, are you of the number? He should have said, yes, I am. And the Lord who said, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. He had already ordained he will preach on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 will be converted. He forgot what the Lord had said in a way. Sometimes we'll forget the promise, the provision, the peak is taking us to. And so when challenges come, and somebody challenges us because we forget, we forget who our leader, Lord, is. 
then we chicken her out. And, but that was not the end of Peter. He repented. You will repent. Yeah. And he tells us in that chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 72, chapter 14 of Mark, verse 72. And it says, the second time, the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said unto him. Before the cock crow, twice thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. He said, I'm so sorry for that. I let you down. And Jesus is so magnanimous and merciful. And he forgave him. He had done the greatest, permitted the greatest crime against a savior, but he was forgiven. This afternoon, he forgives you. Amen. You look back at the foolish things you had said, the foolish things you had done, the foolish things you have gotten yourself involved in, and all you do is to repent, to say, Lord, did I say that? How could I have done that? And you turn around and Jesus says, your sin, which is deep like dye, like crimson, is forgiven and you are forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 15 is the reconciling perpetration of the sacrificial lamb. Here is the chapter where even though he was innocent, he was taken, he was crucified, he was killed. Why? Because he was standing as a sacrificial lamb. And that is the sacrifice that reconciles everyone unto God. And today, reconciliation has come for you. Chapter 16, after he died in chapter 15, now he rose again. This is the risen prince, our supernatural Lord. He rose, he rose again, and he transfers the power of resurrection into our lives. Everything that is dead in you will rise again. Amen. Your life dead no purpose, no direction, no achievement, no courage, no passion to do anything. Everything that is dead in you, in connection with the risen Lord, everything will rise again in Jesus' name. The risen Prince, our supernatural Lord. And now here is what he gives us in chapter 16. Verse 15. In verse 15, it said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What he had been doing, he now transfers to his people and preach the gospel to every creature. In verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I believe. I believe. I believe. Whatever I was yesterday, today, I believe. Wherever I was yesterday, today, I believe. Whatever I did not believe yesterday, today, I believe. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Salvation for you. Super abundance for you. But, but, but. Every coin has two sides. Every currency paper, currency note has two sides. Every life has two sides. Every decision has two sides. There is he that believeth saved. There is he that says no. I hold on to my ignorance of yesterday. Yesteryears, 
And even today, I'm still holding on to what I did not believe yesterday. But he that believeth not shall be damned. I pray you will not be damned. Amen. I will not be damned. The difference between those who are damned and doomed and destroyed and the people who are saved and secured and they come to the light of life. The difference is he believes and he believes not. And I choose to believe. I choose to believe. And the Lord confirmed the consequence of that believing in your heart, in your life, in Jesus' name. As I round up, look at verse 17. Verse 17. And this sign shall follow them that believe. All that follows those who don't believe. Shadows and shame and suffering. But he that believes, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. In verse 18, they shall take off serpents, throw them away. And if they drink any deadly sin, it shall not hurt them. Amen. You will not die before your time. Amen. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. Verse 19, so then... After the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and he sat on the right hand of God. And then in verse 20, verse 20 says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them. You are going forth. Back home back to the field, back to your company, back to everywhere you have something good going on. Good will become better. The better will become the best. You used to walk alone in your own strength, in your own power, but now the Lord is going back with you. The moment you believe him, he goes with you everywhere walking with you and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Another amen. amen. A good thunderous amen. amen. We've seen Jesus as the leader. Servant leader. We've seen Jesus as the leader. Shepherd leader. We've seen Jesus as the leader, the successful leader. We've seen Jesus as the leader, is a strategizing leader. We've seen Jesus as the leader, he is the self sacrificing leader. We've seen Jesus as the leader, and he is the spiritual, scriptural leader. We've seen Jesus as the leader, the set leader. The seated leader and the settled leader. And he's giving you a sign to draw you up. He'll set you as a successful leader. You'll be settled and seated as a successful leader. And the glory and the virtue and the power of the leader, Jesus Christ, the perfect model of a servant leader, be transferred into your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up as we pray. Remember, it was presented unto you so that the same goodness in him and the same grace in him will flow into your life. The moment you say, I didn't know that before. Now I know, I believe. Just said the Lord, Lord, I believe you.
and I give myself, surrender my life unto you, you are now my Savior, Lord, my Savior as my Lord. And as you pronounce that, you accept that, you believe that, and you conform your leader, your leadership by his grace to this pattern of Christ. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will be the power, the passion, the purpose that drive, that works in you from now on. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for what we have heard about the servant leader you sent to this world who became a savior, Lord. We're asking, Lord, your grant the people who have had this about Jesus to believe that now he is their savior. Amen. He is their Lord. Amen. And the power to go forth and achieve everything you have ordained, they will achieve. Grant to everyone. Amen. Powerlessness is gone. The poverty of spirit is gone. Amen. And that backward life is gone. Amen. New life. Amen. Eternal life. Amen. Super abundant life. Amen. Progressive life. Amen. Imparted your life right now. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know it is done. Amen. In Jesus' name, I pray.